We're in the book of Psalms, and, and last week I went a little bit long and only did one psalm. But I, but I kind of I get it like a free pass because it was like 50 verses, you know. So um, we're going to try to do Psalm 19, 20, and 21 this week. We'll just see how far it goes. Psalm 19 That's where we're going to pick it up. And the reason I'm saying I'm not quite sure is because Psalm 19 is one of my favorite psalms. And there's an awful lot in Psalm 19 that, that, that I want to talk about. Anyway, our English word... Um, there we go. Our, our English word psalm, that's, that is actually an English word. It comes from the Greek word psalmos, which means a poem sung to a musical accompaniment, and in particular, stringed instruments. So um, guitars are very appropriate. Guitars, harps, pianos. Pianos are, are stringed instruments. In, inside here, there's lots of strings, you know. Okay. The Hebrew word for psalm is Tehillim, which, and it means praises. The book of Psalms is the hymn book of God's people, or we could call it the hymn book because it is all about him. The writer of Hebrews quotes Psalm 40, verse 8, when he writes, Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. And we, we see that verse not just as the Psalms, but even spilling out into all the scriptures, that it's all about Jesus. But, but it's quoting from Psalm 40. The whole book is about him. Um, it's soul music. Music touches the soul. Um, it's soulish in nature. In other words, it touches your emotions. That's why we like music. Most of us like music in some way. It touches us. It touches our emotions. And uh, you're going to find all kinds of emotions expressed in the Psalms. We mentioned this last week. For every sigh, there is a psalm. There are, song, there are songs about being angry. There are songs about being joyful. Songs about being sad. Psalms about feeling Lost. There's all kinds of things that are expressed in the Psalms. It's 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 a wonderful wonderful book. So we're starting off in chapter 19 tonight. It is to the chief musician, a Psalm of David. Charles Spurgeon writes that he writes this in his earliest days, the psalmist David, while keeping his father's flock, had devoted himself to the study of God's two great books the book of creation or nature and scripture. And he had so thoroughly entered into the spirit of these two only volumes in his library that he was able to devout criticism to compare and contrast, then con compare and contrast them, magnify the excellency of the author as seen in both. The idea is that it's, it's as if when David was growing up, he only had two books he could read. The book of creation, by looking all around him, growing up outside, seeing everything. He's calling that a book. And the, and the scriptures. And that's what Psalm 19 is about. It's about these two books. That's how you can remember Psalm 19. So the first six verses is God's first book, or the book of creation. Verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. The heavens declare the glory of God. We serve an amazing God, an amazing God. All of creation is a witness to God, the creator. Paul writes in Romans 1, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He's saying that, that all of creation around us makes it obvious that there is a creator. Now, our world is getting really close to, to putting all the blinders on so we don't see it anymore. Um, we think that there's a contradiction between, God, between the Bible and science. There isn't a contradiction. Um, we, we, we have problems understanding and reconciling them sometimes, but there's no contradiction. And in fact, the more you study science, I believe, the more your eyes are opened to the intricate design 
around us. Isaiah wrote that God measures the heavens with the span of his hand. That's in Isaiah 40, verse 12. So when God measures the heavens out, it's like the distance between his, his thumb and his pinky. That's a span. You know, let's see, how many, st- uh, I'll put this star, you know, one and a half spans away, you know. Now, now for us, we're big grown-ups now. And we just have an idea of how big this universe is. That shouldn't make you wonder about God. It should make you be in awe of God. God has never changed. I have a video. This takes us to the extent of the universe, the outer edge of the universe. of artificial satellites. We pull back a little further and you see the orbit of the moon. In, in the speed of light, we're only one second away. We're going to go faster and faster to the edge of the solar system. We're only five hours in light, year, in light speed away. Until we get to the edge of the solar system. One light year away. At five light years, we reach the, the nearest star. And now we're 70 light years away. That's how far our earliest radio signals have traveled. We're a part of the Milky Way galaxy. Right now, we're 100,000. We're, we're moving really fast, 100,000 light years. of the universe. Now, I, I got to admit, I, I, I believe in a big bang, big bang. I think God said, let there be light, and bang, there was light. Um, if you want to argue more, I don't care. I, I, I don't care. I just, I, I hope you grasp what we were just trying to do, to take you from here to the edge of the universe. And we went Billions of light years, 186,000 feet per second is how much how fast light travels. The universe is huge. It's, it's amazing how huge it is. And it all follows laws. In the evening, Theodore Roosevelt and his friend, the naturalist William Beebe, would, would go out and look at the skies, search for a tiny patch of light near the constellation of Pegasus, and they would say this together. This is the spiral galaxy in Andromeda. 
It is as large as our Milky Way. It is one of 100 million galaxies. It consists of 100 billion suns, each larger than our sun. Then Roosevelt would turn to his companion and say, Now, I think we are small enough. Let's go to bed. We are small. Don't let the size of the universe scare you. We serve a big God. The heavens declare the glory of God. It's huge. Bigger than anything Donald Trump could ever build. Huge. That is huge. What God made. We are in awe of God. In verse 2, David writes, Day to day utters speech, and night, to night unto night reveals knowledge. In other words, in both day and night, you see evidence of a creator. Verse 3, there is no speech nor language there where their voice is not heard. It's evident to everyone. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun. He says their line has gone out through all the earth. The word for line is the Hebrew word kav, which means a cord, a line, or a measuring line. It's, it's, a, it's a craftsman measuring tape. And you can see this measuring tape all throughout the whole world. I'd like to suggest that to say that a well-precisioned, mathematically created universe that it just happened is about as credible as saying that Webster's unabridged dictionary, that's the size of it, was accidentally published because of an explosion in a printing factory. That's about, that's about what, you're, what it's close to when you see the design. Or that a Boeing 767 was assembled when a tornado swept through a junkyard. That's what it's like looking at our creation around us and saying, well, it just happened. It just happened. Sir Isaac Newton had a replica of our solar system made in miniature. In the center was the sun with its retinue of planets revolving around it. A scientist entered Newton's study one day and exclaimed, my, what an exquisite thing this is. Who made it? Nobody, replied Newton to the questioner, who was an unbeliever. You must think I'm a fool. Of course somebody made it, and he is a genius. Laying his book aside, Newton arose and laid a hand on his friend's shoulder and said, this thing is but a puny imitation of a much grander system whose laws you and I know. And I am not able to convince you that this mere toy is without designer and maker, yet you, yet you profess to believe that the original from which the design has, ta has been taken is without... Uh, designer or maker, now tell me what sort of reasoning do you reach with, uh, for such incongruous conclu in, uh, conclusions? I mean, so stupid that we look at a watch and we think, wow, that, that, that was, that's pretty, that was, made, that was made well, and you take it apart. You see all the intricacy, all the detail. How can you not look at the universe, whether it's the, the largest scale at the size of it, how everything works in perfect harmony and perfect motion, to the smallest uh, uh, microscopic, think of the genetic code that makes us up. Um, you know, you don't look at computer programs and think it was just an accidental thing. No, there's design in the code in them. Verse 5. The sun which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to its race its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Its, end is, its rising is from one end of heaven. Now, David is using poetic language uh, about the sun here. And there are people who look at this and think, well, it's th there's some, see, the, the Bible's old-fashioned. The Bible thinks that it's the sun that's moving. And yet, if, if at the same time we use the term sunrise and sunset, what time is the sunrise this morning? I think it was 7.08 this morning. You know, what time is sunset? You know, we use those things as, and yet we know better. It, it's just, you know, and yet there's actually truth to what David says, if you want to take it literally. The sun actually travels across the galaxy at 64,000 miles per hour. And in addition to this, the earth spins on its axis 1,000 miles an hour, 
The Earth travels around the sun at 67,000 miles an hour, and the galaxy moves 481,000 miles an hour across the universe. That means that right now, you are moving at over 630,000 miles an hour through the universe. And you thought that the Mad Hatter's tea party got made you sick. <laughs> That's nothing. One more, one more video. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They use no words. Not a sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one. He determines the number of stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. move on to verse 7. Look, at, let's start where this is the second book in his, in his psalm. The law of the Lord, the first book was all about creation, about being about God. The second book is all about God's word. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The law of the Lord is perfect. The word perfect, tamim, mean, meaning having integrity, what is entirely in accord with truth and fact. It means that God's word is perfect. It is without error. The total message of the Bible is about truth. Billy Graham writes, on the cover of your Bible and on my Bible appear the words, Holy Bible. Do you know why the Bible is called holy? Why should it be called holy when there's so much lust and hate and greed and war found in it? I can tell you why. It is because the Bible tells the truth. It tells the truth about God, about man, and about the devil. The Bible teaches that we exchange the truth of God for the devil's lie about sex, for example, and drugs and alcohol and religious hypocrisy. Jesus Christ is the ultimate truth. Furthermore, he told the truth. Jesus said that he was the truth and the truth would make us free. He says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Um, and the simple lesson is this, is that it changes you. It converts you. It changes you. If you commit spending time every day in God's Word, and not just to read it, but to do it, you will be changed. You will be changed if you let this book get into you. Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God is, is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. We don't like that. We don't like it when we're reading stuff and it, and it points out, got to change this thing here. Got to change this part of you. No, 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 no. That part's wrong. That part's wrong. I don't need to change. Yes, you need to change that. 
Yes, you need to change that. It changes you, converts you. Verse, verse 8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The statutes of the Lord are right. God's word is right. There's all kinds of different rules that people have that they like to follow or that they think that are in operation. You've probably heard of Murphy's Law. You know, if anything can go wrong, it will. I found there's another law called, there's Lorenz's Law of Mechanical Repair. This is for you, Michael. Um, after your hands become coated with grease, your nose will begin to itch. That's Lorenz's Law of Mechanical Repair. Then there's the Dilbert Principle. The most effective workers will systematically be moved to the place where they can do the least damage. Management. That's, um, that's for the office. Okay. And then there's Cole's Law, which is thinly sliced cabbage. <laughs> Some people's rules can get them into trouble. Some people say they live by the golden rule, which they mean to be that the one with the gold rules. Sometimes we just want to listen to the things that, that tickle our ears, things that give us permission to do what we know is wrong. It's like picking up the Playboy philosophy. If it feels good, do it. Some people live by that. The older we get, the more polluted we can be by the world's laws. It's kind of funny how children seem to know what's right, sometimes better than we do. Maybe you've seen this. Okay, we've lost video. We've lost our sound. Let's try it again. Where's our Frank? Where's our Frank when we need him? Sing it? Okay. You want to try it again? No. Did you do the software thing that Frank set up on that computer? Do you know what that is? Okay. Well, then let's just skip the little girl giving us a... Give, I don't know if you've seen the video. It's very, very cute. I've got, I've got links on my, um, on my notes. You can download the notes. It's the cutest thing, but it's also the saddest thing in the world. This little three-year-old girl is giving her mom lectures about divorce and just about, can't we just be nice to each other? And, and, and don't stop putting on your mean face all the time, mom, you know, and, and can't you just get along? You know, be nice to dad. You know, it's just, it's, it's very, very, very sad. God's laws are right. Obeying them brings blessing to daily life. Verse 8, he says, the commandment... Oh, there we go. Oh, what else? Okay. Then me, Mom, are you ready to be his friend? Yes. Try not to be that, that high up to be friends. I want everything to be low. Okay? Okay. Just try your best. I I don't want you and my dad to be replaced and and me again. I want you and my dad to be placed and settled and be friends. I'm not trying to be mean. I just want everyone to be friends. And if I can be nice, I think all of us can be nice too. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm trying to do my best in my heart. Nothing else than that. I want you, Mom, my dad, everyone to be friends. I want everyone to be smiling. Not like being mad. I want everything to smile. Especially when I see someone, I want them to smile. Especially Nana, everyone. I want everyone to smile. Isn't it kind of sad to, to be lectured by a, by a three-year-old who seems to know better than mom? Um, but we get polluted by this world. The, the friends, the most, the most pure thing that you can read is God's word. God's word is right. It's the right way. Verse 8, the commandment of the Lord is pure. I got I to gotta admit, sometimes I expose my mind to some pretty trashy stuff. Sometimes it's by accident. Sometimes I purposely pick up the bad stuff. Your mother used to threaten to wash your mouth out with soap. 
And let me give you a clue on how to wash your mind. It's with God's word. You cleanse your thoughts with God's word. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. More to be desired are they than gold. It's, it's our treasure chest. It's an incredible book. A man was out walking in the desert when a, a voice said to him, Pick up some pebbles and put them in your pocket, and tomorrow you will be both sorry and glad. The man obeyed. He stooped down and picked up a handful of pebbles and put them in his pocket. The next morning, he reached into his pocket and found diamonds and rubies and emeralds, and he was both glad and sorry, glad that he had taken some, sorry that he hadn't taken more. That's God's word. That's God's word. It's our treasure chest. We get so sidetracked, friends, by all the glitz and the glamour of this world. You've got the greatest treasure in your hand right now. The greatest treasure. Verse 11, moreover, by them, by God's word, uh, your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Um, God's, God's goal is not to ruin your fun. God's goal is to save you from destruction. Um, yes, there is pleasure in sin for a season. We wouldn't do it if it wasn't so fun, right? But, but God's way is so much better. Verse 12. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Secret faults. These are sins of ignorance. Things that you did wrong without realizing it was wrong. Well, can I be at fault if I, if, if I didn't know that it was wrong? Well, can you get a ticket if you don't know what the speed limit is? You bet you can get a ticket. You can do that. I, I know this. Oh, put your hand down. You know, you, This can happen. This can happen. Keep me from secret faults. Verse 13, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Presumptuous sins. These are the things that you do out of deliberate, prideful rebellion. Um, many times I am tempted and I linger too much on the temptation and I give in knowing full well I am in rebellion to God when I do it. And David says, God, help me with these things. Verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Um, the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, um, all life flows from your heart. It starts with your heart. Guard your heart. Words come from what's in your heart. Actions come from what's in your heart. Um, I pray this every time, every time I teach. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Okay, we've got some songs to sing. If I can get the guy in the back to come on up front. We've been doing this through the book of Psalms. When we are in a psalm that we know some songs that are based on that psalm, we want to stop and sing it just to kind of remind you what the psalm was about. Well, this song, this psalm hit the jackpot. Um, there are a lot of psalms based on Psalm 19. And... Um, and we picked out three of them. The first one is from that first book. The first book, which is what? What was the first book? Creation. And the second psalm is about the second book, which is God's Word. And then the third song is from that little prayer at the end. So let's... Let
of the Lord arise, rejoicing the heart, the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes, more to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than
destinations of my heart be pleasing to you, pleasing to you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. Let's, um, let's do another song, shall we? Look at Psalm 20. Psalm 20, battle song. To the chief musician, a song of David. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the God of Jacob defend you. Um, may the name of the God of Jacob defend you defend you, the name of the God of Jacob. And the lesson I want to talk about just for a minute is about the powerful name. The first phrase where he says, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. If you look at the word Lord, it's capital O, capital, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's actually God's name. Not his name is Lord, um, but when you see it in all caps like that in your Bible, does it, does it this have, blah, 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 blah. It has been one long day. I am so sorry. 
Does everybody see the word Lord on all caps in their Bibles? Do you see what I'm saying in verse 1? It doesn't say that in your, in your version. What version are you using? New Living Translation? Okay. Okay. Well, in the other translations, uh, New Living is a good translation, but where it says, may the Lord, the, the word Lord, when it's all in capitals, it, it's, it's the translator's way of letting you know that the Hebrew text, this is only, an old, this is only old Testament, but the Hebrew text is the name Yahweh is what's used in the Hebrew. Um, uh, that's when it's in all caps. Um, why did they do it this way? Because they're following the tradition of the Jews. And when you learn Hebrew and you are reading through the Old Testament, whenever you see the four letters of God's name, because it's, it's in English, the letters would be Y-H-W-H, roughly. No consonants, uh, no vowels, just consonants. Um, you never say Yahweh, you say Adonai, which is the Hebrew word for Lord. Why did they do that? Because they don't want to ever be guilty of saying God's name in vain, as if they are filthy, dirty people, and how, would, how could I dare uh, say God's name in an unclean state? So they never say God's name. As you're reading through in the Hebrew, and you're reading through, you don't read from right to left, you read from... You don't read from left to right, you read from right to left. And as you're reading through in the Hebrew and you see those four letters, I remember the first, first semester of, of Hebrew, once you start learning that and, you go, and you're reading as well, and, and, and what's that word? And, and you want to say it, but you can't. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to say Adonai. Oh, I'm going to go off on a rabbit trail, so I'm not going to do that. Sorry, 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 sorry. So our English translators will put the word Lord in all capitals to let you know that that's actually God's name there. It's his only Old Testament. This is not New Testament. New Testament doesn't work the same. Um, New Testament is in Greek. But in the Hebrew, this is the way it works. So you could, you could translate this, verse 1, May Yahweh answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. His name is Yahweh. David knew the power of God's name. When David faced Goliath, look what he said. He, he said this to Goliath. You come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, and see it's in all caps, in the name of Yahweh. I come to you in the name of Yahweh of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. The Lord of hosts. The word host means the armies, it's the armies, it's, it's the Hebrew word sabaot. He is the Lord, he's the Lord of heaven's armies. I think New Living Translation does it that way, I like that. He's, he's the God of heaven's armies. But David came in the name. He didn't have the spear and the javelin that, that uh, Goliath had, but he had the name. Now he also had a sling and a couple of stones. But that's another story in an, another minute. We find power in the name of Jesus. Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Peter said, silver and gold. This is what he said to the lame man at the gate, beautiful, the, at the temple. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. There is power in the name of Jesus. Peter said that there was salvation in no other name, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must save the powerful name, the name of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, Paul said that God has given him the name above every other name. I know that there's a lot to the concept of the name. A, a name represents a, person's, a, a person, a power, the character of Jesus. But just the name itself is powerful. Speaking in his name, praying in his name brings help. May the Lord answer you. May Yahweh answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. Verse 2. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. Send you help from the sanctuary. It could be talking. This word could describe the temple or the tabernacle on earth. But I think he's talking about heaven. 
He's talking about heaven's sanctuary. He's asking God to send help from heaven. That's a good thing to pray. You can pray that. God, send help from heaven. Send help from the sanctuary. Verse 3, may he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. Selah. Selah means to stop and think about that. Verse 4, may he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. Grant you according to your heart's desire. A lesson I want to call here God's desires. There's once this guy who got this dirty old lamp for his birthday. He cleans it up and poof, out pops a genie. I shall give you three wishes. You may have anything you like. So the guy thinks for a minute. He says, I'd like a billion dollars. You shall have it. And the genie, the genie grants him his wish. Anything else? The guy thinks for a moment. I think this guy's name was Bill Schwimmer. He thinks for a moment. He says, I want a VW. A VW bug with air conditioning, power locks, power windows. You know the works. And, and, and your wish is my command. What, what is your last wish? Hmm, I think I'll save it for a rainy day. Okay, suit yourself, said the genie. So the guy gets into his new Volkswagen, and he goes for a drive to show all his friends, and he turns on the radio, and there's this really old commercial playing, and the guy starts singing with it. Oh, I wish I were an Oscar Mayer wiener. Okay. Truth is, God is not your genie. He doesn't grant you wishes in this sense. When he says, grant you according to your heart's desire, you've got to be careful where you go with this. Because God is not your genie. The key is your heart. What are the desires of your heart? David wrote, Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. I know some people like to take this to think that then God gives you whatever you wish. But I'd like to take it a little deeper. God gives you, if you delight in him, if he is the one that you want more than anything, then what God gives you is the desires themselves. See, the, uh, the, the, the key to answered prayer, friend, is asking according to God's will. And the more you delight in him, the more he changes your desires so that you ask for what God wants. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight, let him be your delight. And he changes your desires. He changes your desires. I think that's what David's saying here. He wants to give you his desires, not mine. Verse 5, we will rejoice in your salvation, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your, your petitions, setting up banners. This was a, a lofty signal flag, not carried around, but it was a stationary flag. It was usually erected on a mountain or other lofty place, and as soon as people could see it, then they would blow the war trumpets, and, and the battle would begin. So... Um, in the name of our God, we will set up our bondage. We will start our, our battles this way. Verse 6, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand, his anointed. It could refer to the king who was, who was anointed with oil. We're going to talk about this on Sunday morning. Um, it, because it, it could also refer to the Messiah because the word Messiah, Mashiach, means um, anointed one. There were three types of people anointed in the Old Testament. Three types of people got oil put on them as a way of starting their job. Prophets, priests, and kings. All three had some type of an anointing ceremony that helped start their job. The Messiah, the Messiah, the Messiah, Peter, Jesus asked the guys, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. So when he says the Lord saves his anointed, he could be talking about himself as a king. And David even called 
Saul, the anointed one, because remember he said, I'm not going to touch the Lord's anointed, but also could refer to the Messiah. Verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord. May the Lord, may the king answer us when we call. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of our God. Um, David is giving you two different ways that an army can enter a battle. You can enter a fight knowing that you have a strong army or you can enter a fight trusting in God. And I'm afraid that right now our nation seems to be kind of falling the way by the wayside on both of them. Um, God help the United States right now. God help us. Some trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name. God wants you to trust him first. David was not a man without physical weapons. David, David didn't just enter battles and said, I trust God, I trust God, I trust God, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. David went into battle with weapons. Even when he faced Goliath, he didn't have a Goliath sword, but he had a sling and a couple of stones. But he came in the name of the Lord. He trusted in the Lord. Some people can fall into the trap of thinking that they should do nothing in life except sit on a sofa and trust God. That's trusting God. I don't want to do anything because if I do something, then I'm not trusting God. That's wrong. Look at this one, David, who is saying, we will trust in the Lord our God. He's trusting in God first. Doesn't mean he never goes out and and fights a battle. Doesn't mean he never picks up a weapon. He does all that stuff but he trusts in God first. Last week, I started this project. Frank, I finished it. I upgraded my laptop. I, I had never, it's been a long time since I've upgraded a laptop. Um, and I wanted to put in an SSD drive into my laptop. That's a solid state drive that makes your laptop super duper fast. And, um, and it was quite a chore. A, a, a little over a week ago, I got all the I got all the parts. My son helped me. He he looked everything up online and he helped me order everything. So I got all the right parts. And I got all the right parts. And I think it was like a Tuesday. It was Tuesday night or Wednesday night. I can't remember last week. And I I I stayed up late trying to get this thing to work. And laptop parts are itty bitty teeny tiny parts. They're not like you know desktop parts. They're little teeny tiny things. I think I. Must, I think I need a microscope or something. I don't know. I was thinking I need a magnifying glass because I just could not get this little, this little SATA cable into this little itty bitty 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 hole. I couldn't get it to work. I couldn't get it. I, I tried like five, six times. I was getting so mad. I know me. I know me. I was about to pick it up and throw it. <laughs> I was. You know, I was, I was all this money that I spent, I was just going to throw, I was just going to get a hammer and pound it in, make it work, you know. I actually, for the first time in my life, I had a little moment of wisdom, and I said, I think I shall go to bed. <laughs> so I did. I, I, unpl- I unplugged everything that I had done, kind of undid part of it, and I went to bed. And I said, we will start it over in the morning. And so the next morning, I got up, and I, was, I went on on my walk, and I was praying, and I thought, I probably ought to ask God for help. Shouldn't I? That's kind of stupid, right? The pastor asking God for help. I can do this. I am a semi-tech guy. You know, I know this kind of stuff. But I said, you know what, God, I really need your help. I need your help with this thing. And so later on in the morning, after I got my shower and got, got I, I thought, well, let's just, just, I'll just try it one more time. I tried it one more time. I plugged the thing in and I turned on my laptop. And it worked. Now, that's probably not the kind of a miracle that a, that a dyed-in-the-wool atheist is going to accept as a miracle. But I went back to what this is talking about. We will trust in the name of our God first. We trust him first. It doesn't mean you don't do anything else in your life. But it means you go to him first. Put your life in his, hand, in his hands first. Give him the situation first. First, before you go out and try to fight your battles, go to him first. 
He might change your battle plan. He might change what weapons you take into the battle. Go to him first. Some trust in chariots. We, we will trust in the name of our God. Won't we? Amen. Chapter 21. Let's just do another one real quick. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. The king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, and in your salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. Selah. So stop and think about it. He's saying, he's saying that God has actually answered my prayer. How about that? Like he got his laptop working. Verse 3. For you meet him with the blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold on his head. You, he asked life from you and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. So these are some of the blessings that David had asked God for. A crown to rule. And it was a pure gold crown, not just any crown. And, and life, God, gave, God would give David a long life. Verse 5, his glory is great. His glory is great in your salvation. Honor and majesty you have placed upon him. David understood that, that what made him a great king and gave him much recognition and honor was only in what God had done in his life. Um, my glory, David would be saying, is great because of your salvation, only because of what you've done. Verse 6, for you have made him most blessed forever. You have made him exceedingly glad in your presence. I want to just talk for a minute about joy with Papa. David wrote in Psalm 16, he said, you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You know that there is joy in God's presence. Every once in a while, when you come to church, it's okay to smile. Some of us look like that when we come into church. <laughs> I think that some of us can be a little bit too serious about life. I think some of us need to lighten up a little bit. Because there is joy in God's presence. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to smile. It's okay to put your burdens in his hands and let them go. And even though everybody else knows that you're under the biggest load that you've ever been under, you can smile because you're in God's presence. It's okay. I don't think any of these videos was done with a secret hidden camera. The babies are all laughing because mommy, mommy and daddy are there. And they're making them laugh. And when you're in God's presence, it's okay to have joy. He can make us exceedingly glad. For the king, verse 7, trusts in the Lord, and through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Through the mercy of the Most High. David had learned in his life that stability, that this not being moved, through the mercy of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Stability in his life came from mercy. Not judgment. Mercy. God's mercy. Beloved, when you sin, and you will, I'm sorry to say that. I'm not speaking prophetically. I'm not giving you permission. I'm not giving you permission to sin. I'm not doing that. But when you sin, go to him. Find mercy. Mercy. Don't dwell under the condemnation too long. Stability comes from his mercy. Oh, but I've just taken advantage of God too many times. Friend, friend, 
You don't know His grace, His mercy. Stability comes from mercy. We ought to find ourselves swimming in His grace. Verse 8, your hand will find all your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. You shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord will, shall swallow them up in his wrath and the fire shall devour them. Their offspring you shall destroy from the earth and their descendants from among the sons of men. For they intended evil against you. They devised a plot which they are not able to perform. Therefore, you will make them turn their back. You will make ready your arrows on your string toward their faces. Be exalted, O God, in your own strength, and we will sing and praise your power. One last little thing here. He talks about your hand will find all your enemies. God will deal with his enemies, but for now, there is mercy. Um. You don't want to find yourself at the end. Um, Steve, you and I were talking about this a little bit. You know, at the end of your life, you don't want to. You don't want to find yourself at the end of life as God's enemy. You don't want to be saying no to Him. You want to be saying yes to Him because there is mercy. Some people want to know why hasn't God dealt with all the evil in the world? Well, you know what? Because He would rather show mercy now to give people a chance to turn around. That's what 2 Peter 3.9 is all about. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. The Bible says God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. We wish God would smite them and squash them, you know, and, and burn them all up. But God wants them to turn and find mercy. And so he's patient. That's why he doesn't wipe out the world yet. And we need to learn to let God handle the enemies. Because that's really what David is doing. He's letting God handle the enemies. Too often we take things in our own hands, like the, the truck driver that, was, that dropped by an all-night restaurant in Broken Bow, Nebraska, and the waitress had just served him when three swaggering, leather-jacketed motorcyclists Health angels, they all walked in and they were spoiling for a fight. One grabs the hamburger off his plate. The other takes a handful of, of the trucker's french fries. The third picks up his coffee and begins to drink it. The trucker didn't respond like you would expect. Instead, he, he got up very calmly, he picked up his check, walked to the front of the room, put the check and his money on the cash register and went out the door. Oh, there's the, there's the health angel, sorry. He went out the door. The waitress follows him to put the money in the till, and she stands there watching out the door as the big truck drives away into the night. When she returned, one of the bikers said to her, he's not much of a man, is he? She said, I, I really can't answer that, but he's also not much of a truck driver. He just, just ran over three motorcycles out in the parking lot. Well, see, that's what we would like to do. We would like to take things into our own hands. But life is much better when you put the situation in God's hand. We'll end with this verse. Romans 12. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. And with that, let's stand. Let's pray. So, Lord, we want to throw ourselves on your mercy. And we are so grateful, God, for your mercy. Wash us, cleanse us. Help us to taste the joy that comes in your presence. And Lord, as we are learning to delight ourselves in you, would you change our hearts? Give us your heart. Give us a heart for the things that you care for. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you.